Good afternoon, AMP Young Musicians. This is my Miss Aisha, and I would like to welcome you all to another edition of AMP Online Masterclass. We have a very special session for you today. We have Miss Jessica Stinson here. She will be talking to you about how do I practice? A very important question that all musicians must ask themselves more than once uh, throughout their time as a musician because you always need to learn how to become better at practicing. We have a lot of time at home and I wanna make sure that you all spend it wisely. So you're not just goofing around when you pick up your instrument or go in the room to practice, but that you are really getting the most out of your time. You can see us, we cannot see you. However, if you wanna talk to us, you can send a message through the chat and I will get back to you. I'll let Miss Jessica know what your question is. We also have a question and answer function that you can use, but um, if you use the chat, I'll see that a little bit faster. Okay, so let's get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I figured I would start while people are still kind of coming in. I, fig I figured I'd start by playing you something that I've been practicing lately. <laughs> Miss Aisha. Um, that was the Jig movement of Bach's second partita in D minor. And that is something I've been practicing lately. And the funny thing about that piece is that I first got that piece, started learning that piece when I was a sophomore in high school. And I have come back to it over the years because every time I come back to it, I find new things to practice in it, which is what's amazing about music because we never stop working on things no matter how good you get how long you've been playing there are always always things to be working on so what i figured i'd talk about today is how i kind of got interested in the subject of practicing and a little bit about what an effective practice routine looks like and then i heard a rumor that there's some people that might be willing to demonstrate um, so maybe we can work on practicing some things together. Um, so first I wanted to share with you guys that, um, I don't know what the average age is of the people that are watching this, um, this class, but when I was around middle school, early high school, um, I started wanting to audition for things like Allstate and for youth orchestras, like the Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra. That was really the only youth orchestra around when I was a kid. There are so many more options now, but when I was that age, I was wanting to audition for these things. And I was, you know, I've been playing for a little while and I had a private teacher. So I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to go in. I'm going to do really awesome. It's going to be great. So um, the first year I auditioned for Allstate, I didn't get in. And the first time I auditioned for the Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra, I didn't get into that either. And it was really, really sad. And it made me confused and it made me wonder what was wrong with me. And then I realized with the help of my teacher and just by learning around with all the things around me that the problem wasn't me, the problem was the way I was working. And the problem was the way I was practicing and that I was gonna need to change the way I practiced in order to achieve some of the goals that I wanted to achieve. So if that is true for you, maybe if you've had some situations where you really wanted something or you just wanted a performance to go really well or something like that, and maybe it didn't go as well as you had hoped, um, perhaps 
taking a closer look at how you practice might help you to have a little bit more success in the future. So that was how I really got interested in practicing to start. So I wanted to get into the um, just the practicing process and let you guys know how kind of I structure my practice. And at the end of all of this, I understand that if you guys have questions, um, you, you can ask me questions and I'll be more than happy to, to answer them if you have anything specific on your mind that you're wondering about. So when you practice, um, one of the first things you need to do is you need to warm up. And warming up is critically important. I know sometimes, especially when you have maybe a smaller amount of time to practice, maybe you only have 20 minutes to practice or 30 minutes to practice and you think, oh, I'm just gonna skip my warm up because I don't have time to warm up. You always need to warm up, even if it's just for a minute or two. Um, on the on days where you're um, pressed for time, a minute or two of warm up might be all you have. On days where you have a lot more practice time, your warm up might be 20 or 30 minutes. But warming up is really important because you're physically warming up your body, you're warming up your muscles, but you're also warming up your brain and you're warming up your ears. Because when you warm up, hopefully you're warming up slowly and carefully, listening to your sound, listening to your intonation, and priming your brain and priming your ears to listen for when you're starting to practice your piece or your etude, whatever it is that you're, you're learning in your practice session. So the warm up is extremely important. Then we go into the nitty gritty, whether you know, you're learning a piece or lessons, maybe you're learning an orchestra, or band, or choral piece, maybe you're practicing an etude, um, or anything, anything like that. There are two things that I want to talk to you guys about today. The first is a practice technique that I think all of my students have heard about already. It's called chunk it, map it, and learn it. Um, now, I can't take credit for that. Um, that was actually a concept that was introduced to me by a violinist in Chicago um, named Renee Paul Gautier. She has a wonderful podcast called Mind Over Finger. And it's a podcast where all they talk about is practicing and mindful practice. And she has interviewed um, string players, wind players, brass players, percussionists, pianists, singers, and conductors. So no matter what you play, um, I guarantee you that there is an episode on there for you. So if you like podcasts, um, look that up. It's the Mind Over Finger podcast. There are some great, great um, pieces of information on that podcast. I love it. I've probably listened to most of the episodes and there are like 70 episodes or something like that it as her idea. And the first part, which is the, the chunk it part, is just means to divide your piece up into smaller sections. It can be very overwhelming for us as musicians to look at this giant piece in front of us and think, oh my gosh, I have to learn this whole thing. So by dividing it up into smaller sections, it makes it more manageable and it allows you to use your time better. Now for each section, I like to design them as either green, yellow, or red. Sometimes I even get colored pencils out and I mark them in my music. Green is a section that you could probably perform right now. It's not difficult. You know, you can play it with, with ease and fluidity and confidence. And yellow section, maybe something that, you know, maybe but it's okay, you know, it's passable. You could probably, you know, perform it a little bit, or maybe you'd have to stop once or twice, but it's not that big of a deal. The red sections are the ones that are really, really tricky. Maybe you can't make it all the way through. Maybe it's giving you a little bit of anxiety. Maybe you don't know exactly what all of the notes are in that section. Those sections, those red pieces, are the parts that we want to focus on first. So designate all of your chunks in your music as red, yellow, or green. That's the mapping part. So we're looking at what needs my attention right now. Then learn it part is, um, is another little technique I like to, to think about or to use are the four T's. It's tone, tuning, 
timing and technique. And again, that's not mine. I got that from my husband. But <laughs> um, tone, tuning, timing, and technique. Those are the four things that you really need to be thinking about as you go through each chunk and figure out what you need to prioritize in your practice session. So let's talk about all four of those, um, all four of those T's. So let's talk about tone first. I'm gonna grab my notes here so I'm not looking to the side the entire time. So tone is essentially asking yourself, do I like the sound that's coming out of my instrument or do I like the sound that I'm producing? Um, how do you want your instrument to sound? And the thing is, and then this is especially true for, um, for beginners and younger players, we don't really start playing an instrument knowing the ideal sound that we want for ourselves in our heads. That's why it's so important to listen to recordings of your instrument, because the more you listen to other people playing your instrument, the more you listen to these wonderful soloists and concert artists playing your instrument, the more you get a clear picture in your head of what you want to sound like. Because all of those pieces kind of come together in your brain and you might be like, oh, I like that part of their sound, but I don't like that, but I kind of like this. And you piece it all together and it becomes your individual sound. Okay, so listen to recordings, go on YouTube, search for your instrument, search for the pieces that you're playing and listen to um, listen to the things that you find. Go to performances. I know those of you that are in AMP, you guys have a, um, ample opportunity um, to, to listen to other people play, to hear performances. And we live in a, in a city where there's a lot of music happening, not right now, um, but normally. And so going to performances is a really important, important opportunity to get an idea of what your sound should be like. So um, the specifics of tone are, of course, instrument and voice specific, but there are some universal things that are true. And I wanted to just touch on those really quick. Um, so posture and setup. So making sure that you're sitting up tall, making sure that you are, if you play an instrument, that you're holding the instrument properly. This is really important. You're not going to have a good sound if your posture is not good. Um, tension. You know, whether you, if you have too much tension, it's going to negatively affect your sound. So everyone, every instrument, all singers and every, everybody always talks about relaxing and releasing. And that's really, really important. So you want to monitor your tension. Um, you want to think about your proper technique. So if you're a wind or a brass player, that might be your embouchure. If you're a string player, that might be your bow hold or your hand shape. Um, Miss Aisha can comment on what that would be for a voice because I have no idea. But <laughs> listen to your teacher and focus on the things that they are always talking about um, because that is going to be critical to producing a good tone. So the second T is tuning. Of course, tuning is something that we are all familiar with. That's, am I playing the right notes? Am I playing the correct pitches? And the easiest way to figure this out is to, and you're going to hear me say this a bunch today, practice slowly. You cannot hear yourself if you are going a million miles a minute, right? You have to slow it down so that you can really hear what's happening and focus on what's happening. It's so, so important. Slow down. I'm going to say that 17 more times today. Um, Use a tuner or a drone. So um, I don't personally in my teaching and in my own playing, I don't use electronic tuners very much, but they are very beneficial and very helpful. So if you like using a tuner, use a tuner or use a drone. You are a string player, you are in luck because you have built in drones in your instrument. So for example, last year I, um, performed a Mozart's Fifth Violin Concerto with the LaGrange Symphony in LaGrange, Georgia. And in the opening, the, um, the, there's this A major arpeggio. And it's really hard to play in tune. And I was really struggling with how to play this. And I was, I was going back and forth. when I realized that the best tuner that I had was my open A string, which happens to be right next door. And so 
I could listen to every note in comparison to my open string and get a much better idea of how in tune I was. And that was incredibly helpful. So string players, use your open strings. And um, if it, for everyone, use a tuner. But the most important tool is your ears. And the more you use your ears, the better your ears will get. So tuning is incredibly important. You want to also figure out what key your piece is in, play scales in that key. If your piece is in D major, play a bunch of D major scales, play D major arpeggios, figure it all out, play, get really used to that scale because if the more fluent you are in the scale, the easier it's gonna be for you to play that piece in tune. Now for passages and pieces where you have, let's say you have a bunch of 16,000, they're really, really fast. Um, there's a technique that I learned when I was probably about 10 or 11 years old by one of my first violin teachers that I have been using ever since and it's called edging. And edging is basically when you focus on learning one measure, you learn the like, measure one, you learn it, you really focus on it, you practice it slowly, you work it up to tempo so that it gets up to concert tempo, just measure one. And then once you're feeling really good about that measure, then you learn measure two. And then once you've learned measure two in the same way that you learned measure one, you add measures one and two together. Then you learn measure three. Then you learn, you practice measures two and three, and then you practice measures one, two, and three. And you do this for however long your chunk of music that you're working on is. And um, that's why we work in chunks, because if you were to do that for an entire piece, you'd be practicing for 20 hours. And we don't want that. Uh, that that's too long to be practicing in a single day. <laughs> so um, small sections, if you're, if you're really struggling, edging is a wonderful way to, to get through those really challenging parts. So we're going to go on to the third T now, which is timing, rhythm, playing in tempo. This is really important. Am I playing the correct rhythms? So again, practice slowly because sometimes you're practicing quickly and you don't even realize that you're playing the wrong rhythm. Maybe you're flipping the rhythm or you're reading an eighth note as a 16th note, or there's so many things that you can do when you're playing too fast. So slow it down to make sure that you're playing the correct rhythm. Um, clap the rhythm, you know, put your instrument down and clap along. Um, or you can count out loud while, while tapping your toe or tapping your foot. Um, those of you um, in ensembles have maybe done this in rehearsal. So count out loud, tap along, get that rhythm in your body so that you understand it better. Um, take a challenging rhythm from your piece and put it into a scale. Just play every single note of the scale in that rhythm that makes it so much easier to internalize that rhythm. It also makes it easier for you to just focus on the rhythm and not the notes. And then when you come back and put it in the piece, all of a sudden it's gonna feel a lot easier. And of course, our um, good friend and best friend, the metronome. Uh, if you don't have a metronome, you need a metronome. Fortunately, there are lots of free metronome apps if you have a smartphone. There's also, um, if you, you go into Google and you search for metronome online, a metronome will actually pop up in Google. So there's no excuse. So get find a metronome and practice with it a lot. Get used to practicing with the metronome. A lot of times what happens is we start um, practicing with the metronome and we're like, I don't know what's wrong with this metronome. This metronome is off. I'm right. The metronome is wrong. That's not true. So uh, a lot of times we think that our timing is more solid than it is. So metronomes will, um, will, will challenge you and, and also help your timing be a lot better, which your conductors will appreciate. Yes, Miss Aisha. Hey, Miss Jessica, this is great. You've got some, yes, you've got some great stuff that you are sharing. I, I want to ask about something you just said. Sure. Um, you said you focus on the rhythm, of course. I hope everyone heard her say, clap the rhythm count out loud she did say out loud when you're clapping the rhythm and this idea of doing the scale in that rhythm mm -hmm. that's really important i think a lot of us are not doing that could you um either with the piece you just played or, or anything could you just demonstrate what does that mean if to 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 do that that would be helpful if you can just demonstrate that a little bit 
Okay, so for um, for the piece that I played at the beginning of the um, of the session, which um, I don't know if all of you were here to hear that, but it was a piece by Bach, and it's in twelve eight, which is um, it, which is four beats to a measure, but each beat is a dotted quarter note, so you've got three eighth notes in each beat, so it's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve, and you might want to practice. There's a um, there, in this piece, there are a lot of two slurred eighth notes and then a separate. So I might practice, this is in D minor, so I might practice. So I might do something like that just to, because that's, that's, it, that's such a prevalent rhythm in this piece, and that gets me feeling in the 12 8 too. So I'm thinking, bum, 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 bum. And you need that, especially if it's a piece in a time signature that you're not super familiar with. So, six, eight, you know, two, four, things like that, that, are, that may be a little bit tricky at first. That's a great way to work on it. Does that help? All right. Um, so the um, the timing we talked about. We talked about clapping. We talked about counting out loud. We talked about practicing with the metronome. Now we're on to our last T, which is technique. And this is um, technique is actually kind of the umbrella that all of the other T's, the other three T's, go under. Everything is based on technique. What aspects of my technique do I need to focus on to improve the other three T's? So um, this can be instrument specific. So for strings, this could mean working on shifting or specific bow strokes like spiccato or up bow staccato or something like that. Um, universally, this could mean um, dynamics. How do I change my technique to go from loud to soft or vice versa to do a really good crescendo or a really good diminuendo? Um, how do I pace out an accelerando? How do I get faster? How does that affect um, the other aspects of my technique? So these are things that these are the questions that you need to ask yourself because everything can be kind of boiled down to one thing, which kind of leads me to my general comment, which is that Practicing, and I think, again, my students have heard this before, but practicing is kind of like being a scientist in a laboratory, right? So you're conducting, every time you go through that chunk of music, you're conducting an experiment. You're making a hypothesis, which is this is the thing that I think I'm going to do that's going to make it sound better or sound more in tune or be more rhythmic or get closer to that sound that I have in my head. So I'm going to make this hypothesis. I'm going to try this experiment. And then I'm going to evaluate at the end and see how I did, see how my experiment went. So you make your hypothesis, you run your experiment, you record your results. Um, recording your results in the practice room um, is often best done with a recording device. So if you have a recording, um, recording capability on your phone or maybe on your computer, if you have like an old tape recorder, maybe your parents have an old tape recorder, I don't know. Um, find something to record yourself with and listen back and then there you've got your answer did my experiment work did my experiment not work so if it worked great you've made progress if it didn't work make another hypothesis run the experiment again and you rinse and repeat until you start to feel like you're heading in the right direction so and that's what that's the the thing that i want to make sure that you guys all know and understand is that Practice isn't about sounding like the most brilliant violinist or trumpet player or bassoon player or vocalist in the whole world. It's not about just dazzling everybody that walks by your practice room. It's about getting curious as to how can I make the best sound I can make? How can I play this even more in tune? How can I get this really rhythmic? How, how can I stay with the metronome and not rush or not drag? And getting curious about those things, running those experiments and seeing how different aspects and elements of your technique affect those four T's that we just talked about. So that's the that's the main thing. And the um, the other thing before uh, before I take questions and maybe we do like a demonstration is um, the, for, for those of you that um, 
that don't know, I think one or two of you might know this already, but even though I'm a professional violinist that's been playing professionally for 10 years, I still occasionally take lessons. And I um, actually had a violin lesson a week ago. And um, one and the person that I was taking this lesson with has this whole theory about how not practice makes perfect, but practice makes performance. And what that means is that how you show up in the practice room is what's going to show up on stage. So if you're spending your practice time just rushing through things, trying to get through as much as you can, um, not really paying attention to your tone or your timing or uh, anything like that, then what do you think is going to come out on stage? It's going to be rushed and it's not going to in, in the, the tone and the timing won't be right. But if you're working slowly and focusing on creating a beautiful sound and in um, playing your notes in tune, playing your notes in time, and you're doing that, you're creating the environment for that, then that's what's going to show up on stage. So don't expect a miracle to happen in performances because what's going to show up on the stage is exactly what's been showing up in the practice room. So that's the that's the big takeaway that I hope that you guys get from this. And um, I think we, have, we only have what, about four minutes left. So um, maybe, Ms. Ayesha, do you think it would be good to take questions? Yes, um, I got a couple of questions here. Great. Um, that was wonderful. Thank you for all of those tidbits, lots of gems in there. So I hope, I hope you guys were paying attention. Um, but when you take all of these gems that you gave us, practically when we get in the room, how much should we practice like we're going to chunk it but what does that look like this is chunk three hours it's chunk three minutes okay i like how much do, um do we practice how many days a week um how how long should we should each practice session be that type of thing okay so this is this is my philosophy on how much you practice first consistency is more important than duration of your practice session what that means is that i'm going to be happy as i'm going to be happier as a teacher if you practice 30 minutes a day six days a week than if you practice an hour and a half twice a week so even though the sessions were longer and maybe you felt like really good about yourself because you practiced for an hour and a half you're not going to retain as much of what you did in your practice session because you're not doing it as often i mean i we've all um maybe not all of us but some of us may have had experiences cramming for a test or cramming for a quiz or something like that and when you absorb a ton of information in a short period of time it's harder to retain. So my big thing is consistency, being consistent, establishing the habit of practicing every day. If you're younger um, or a beginner at your instrument, maybe you can set a number of minutes as a goal um, just to establish the habit of practicing. But if you're older or more advanced, I would definitely write out what you want to accomplish in your practice session and once you've accomplished that then you're done so that's it could take two hours it could take 45 minutes if you're working really really well um so i i i, I hesitate to say a number i just want everyone to kind of come away with this thinking that they can make the most out of it. You have to set goals. Don't just go into a practice room and start playing and just, you know, see what happens. Set goals for yourself based off of what you talk to your teacher, or your conductor, or whoever about, and work towards setting those goals. I will say, um, take frequent breaks. Um, I, I take a break maybe every 20, 25 minutes, just for five minutes or so, just to get water and clear my head. Um, it's going to help you to work better if you have a clear head. So, um, so I, I'm not going to say, you know, practice five hours a day or practice two hours a day, but um, set, create a list of goals, work towards accomplishing those goals in every practice session and do it every day. <laughs> every day. Every day. That's, that's really helpful, Ms. Jessica. Thank you. Um, for all of our AMP young musicians, we've got a great crew that has joined us today. I hope um, you guys are enjoying uh, for what Ms. Jessica said, I want you to start putting it into practice starting today. Um, everyone has something that they can practice 
And so we want for you guys to start practicing at home. And if you have private lessons, if you're in the AMP Academy, your teacher, of course, will be checking you. And if you're not in the AMP Academy, your program leader will be checking with you periodically just to see how you're doing with your practicing. They may ask to hear you play something that you've been practicing, and they may um, ask you to, to do a video. So what we're going to do is we're going to start a, an online challenge, a video challenge to see AMP young musicians practicing at home and see how well we're doing with this. Um, one of our students, uh, young musicians, is actually ready to share something now. Ms. Jessica, it's one of your own. Um, Mr. Donovan Fuller. So Donovan, I'm going to bring you on um, for the, the one minute we have left. And um, we only have like 30 seconds, really, Donovan. But I'm going to bring you on really quickly so that you can just share with us a little bit of what you've been practicing, because I know that Ms. Um, Jessica has worked with you on how to practice. So here comes Donovan. I'm going to unmute him. OK, so you got to start your video. We can hear you, but we can't see you yet. There you go. Hey. OK, so uh, I'm working on uh, the Cillian and uh, Rigadoon by uh, Fritz Chrysler. Uh, it's kind of uh, in the style of a Frank a Frank core, meaning that it's like a dance like that, that they did in the 16th century. Um, I've had it for a while now and I've uh, I've gotten I've, I've gotten to pretty far with it. It's it's a uh, it's a pretty hard piece to play to get to get right actually. Um, not not to play because you know me I I can play anything. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> to play the rigadoon? Um, do, uh, Miss Aisha, do we have time or what do you think? Oh, Miss Aisha, you're muted, I think. There you, uh, there you are. Okay, sorry about that. I had a little te technical difficulty there. Um, we are actually a little bit over time. But I will give you a moment to give a little bit of feedback from Donovan. And I have a really quick question that I think you can answer quickly before we completely wrap up. OK, so um, so Donovan, it's uh, so I've, of course, been listening to Donovan play this for a little a little while now. Um, and what's wonderful about what Donovan is doing is that he is every time I hear this opening of his piece, he is understanding the style of it more and more. The challenging thing about this is that it is kind of an early music style and we don't um, do that as often. Um, so he's really learned a lot about how to play this and it's really coming mm. along. So um, thank you, Donovan, very good job. Um, 
yeah, I think it's just, you know, we're, we're, we're working on the bow strokes and the things like that to, to improve it, but it's, it's, it's really on the right track. Excellent. Thank you for joining us, Donovan. No Thank problem. you, Donovan. I got a, uh, Donovan, I'm going to leave you on because we're about to wrap up. I just got a really quick question. Miss Jessica, as, as a violinist, is it okay to never take your violin out of playing position for 30 to 40 minute periods? Um, I would at least suggest it's, it's okay, but I would really strongly suggest um, taking your violin out of playing position um, every so often just to kind of relax your muscles because sometimes you don't know what kind of tension you're holding mm -hmm. in your neck and in your shoulders and in your back and all that kind of stuff. And the thing is, is that when you're younger, um, you're, you know, you're, you've got a lot of energy and sometimes you can you can practice for a really long period of time without ever coming out of playing position but you'll start to feel it over time so take care of yourself as you're practicing so that as you get older um old and decrepit like me um, you can you can be able to continue to do that and be able to play for for long periods of time Awesome, Miss Jessica. This was uh, very informative. Thank you so much for joining us. To all of our young musicians of the Atlanta Music Project, thanks for joining in. Special shout out to Donovan for being the first to demonstrate anything on our AMP Online series. We appreciate you. To all of you watching, get those instruments out. Let's get to practicing. We will be coming to hear what you guys have been working on. Have an awesome afternoon and tomorrow, 4 p.m. Everyone, I don't care what your primary instrument is, everyone is welcome to come and get some of that tension out that Ms. Jessica talked about by scatting. Okay, now is the perfect time to let loose and do some singing with us. So I hope to see you guys then. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.